Hello, my name is Troy Parfit, and welcome to Jordan Peterson and Neo-Nazism, What You Need to Know, Part 3, the final installment of this series. Once again, if you would like a PDF of Jordan Peterson and Neo-Nazism, What You Need to Know, you can email me at teparfit at gmail.com. In the subject line, please be sure to include the phrase Jordan Peterson and Neo-Nazism. My email address is on your screen now. All settled in? Let's begin. Among Jordan Peterson's countless insidious aims, he hopes to foment a race war, culture war, or revolution to overthrow democracy. Essentially, he wishes to achieve what Trump tried to achieve when he told his neo-fascist and occultic followers were going to the Capitol. Peterson praised Trump, met with Donald Trump Jr., and referred to the 2021 storming of the U.S. Capitol as quote-unquote events. He criticized officials for imposing a curfew after such events. Once more, whereas Trump's exhortations were thinly veiled, Peterson's are normally cryptic. He would like to create the conditions for the Holocaust Part 2, hence his obsession with understanding why ordinary people participated in the Holocaust and the question, how does a man transform in that manner? While telling his students about research he had done on the discourse that precedes genocide, he said one of his findings was, the enhancement of the sense of victimization on the part of one of the groups, usually the group that's going to commit the genocide. First, their sense of being victim is much heightened by the demagogues who are trying to stir up this sort of hatred. So they basically say, look, you've been oppressed in a variety of ways, and these are the people who did it, and they're not going to stop doing it, and this time we're going to get them before they get us. Peterson was describing one of his own strategies, when he told his Norwegian audience that they needed to wake up to pernicious governments who prosecute neo-Nazis. He also encouraged them to push back, because... If you think that sort of judgment isn't going to affect what you get to say, well, you've got another thing coming. He is the demagogue trying to stir up hatred. He sows division between the young men he saves from the clutches of the far right and all the people he says are their enemies, educators, lawmakers, journalists, women, liberals, members of the LGBTQ plus community, politicians, Democrats, and practically everyone besides him, his devotees, and his coterie of strange and bigoted alt-right associates. When he made the false claim that Canada's Bill C-16 contained compelled speech legislation, he said publicly that the non-existent law was the product of a communist plot. During a Senate committee hearing, he claimed it was the result of the Marxist element. Hitler complained about communist elements and said, Jewish Bolshevism is a totally alien element. According to the Canadian Bar Association, Bill C-16 adds gender identity or expression to identifiable groups protected from those who advocate genocide, publicly incite hatred likely to lead to a breach of the peace, or willfully promote hatred against them. Why, it is almost as if the bill was designed with Peterson in mind. Peterson said that when he read Bill C-16, he could not sleep because his mind was racing. He twirled the fingers of his right hand next to the right side of his head, as someone might to indicate insanity. And this brings us to our next picture. The caption reads, Artwork in Peterson's House. Rule 8 from Beyond Order is, Try to make one room in your home as beautiful as possible. After the Bar Association and legal experts clarified that Bill C-16 had nothing to do with compelled speech, a fact corroborated by Peterson's own lawyer, Peterson told Americans that Canada's compelled speech laws had come into effect. He added that they were also on the books in America, for example, New York, quote, although people don't know it yet, end quote. Put another way, the Marxist element had spread from communist Canada to the free United States. To be clear, when Peterson crusaded against a bill that protected from those who advocate genocide, which he blamed on the Marxists, he was signaling to the paranoid, the gullible, and the benevolent alt-right. He was implying that people's speech would be tightly controlled by the oppressive Canadian government and its scheming cabal of Jewish wire pullers. Of course, Peterson will almost certainly never achieve his genocidal goal, not least of all because most people appear to have no idea what he is talking about. Many of his fans think he is telling them to be a good person or have better posture. 
However, having unrealistic goals is precisely the sort of psychotic delusion exhibited by schizophrenics and a marker of psychopathy. Also, some people do achieve the seemingly unachievable. Take Hitler, who began fantasizing about gassing the Jews 17 years before the Nazis began using Zyklon B. In the 1920s, Hitler too was a crypto-fascist. He channeled the Bible to make a coded allusion to exterminating the Jews. He talked about mystical runes in Egyptian pyramids. He spoke like a necromancer. And he floated half-baked theories that he learned from the occult. Nazism was rooted in mysticism, mythology, folk beliefs, occultism, anti-scientific thinking, feelings of inferiority and resentment, intolerance and hatred, or what Jordan Peterson promotes. Peterson has a much better chance of radicalizing his followers to commit acts of violence. In addition to characterizing the actions of mass murderers as logical and understandable, he reminds his listeners that they live in a culture where even murderers are treated with dignity. I believe that Jordan Peterson exhibits dark triad traits, the dark triad being a construct in psychology predicated on antagonism or low agreeableness. Peterson presents with characteristics of narcissism, for example, being grandiose, dominant, arrogant, exhibitionist, and exploitative, psychopathy, for example, being manipulative, having superficial charm, lacking empathy, and having unrealistic goals, and Machiavellianism, for example, exhibiting antisocial behavior and focusing on malevolent aims. In combination with what are obviously psychotic delusions, including more than 105 nightmares he had in one year about nuclear explosions that were so realistic he was afraid to go to sleep, as well as a history of drug abuse, to say that he is troubled would be a serious understatement. In Maps of Meaning, he includes a letter that he wrote to his father which says that writing that book was literally driving him crazy. In describing life after his split, he says, I sketched a harsh, crude picture of a crucified Christ, glaring and demonic, with a cobra wrapped around his naked waist, like a belt. The picture disturbed me. Where in the world had it come from? It came from Aleister Crowley. I hid the painting and sat cross-legged on the floor. I put my head down. The world had apparently gone insane, and something strange and frightening was happening inside my head. For decades, he has been discussing schizophrenia in ways that are clearly autobiographical. For example, he talks about the multiple parts, that is, multiple personalities, and avatars, that is, alters, that speak to him. When he taught at Harvard, he made a covert reference to the voice with the eyes that appeared in his mind after his split, calling it a monster. As you listen to the following quote, know that he has called himself a monster, Hitler a true monster, and has told his followers that morality comes when you're a monster. If you start to understand who you are, then you understand the Nazis. Peterson, and I think what you do under those circumstances is, you activate a monster, so to speak, that lives in your right hemisphere, and it gets more and more and more powerful until one day, at a weak moment, say, it just swallows you whole. And that's when you fall catastrophically into depression, or terrible anxiety, or maybe even, depending on your physiological predisposition, to something resembling schizophrenia. These days, Peterson still says he suffers from depression and terrible anxiety. He has a physiological predisposition to these issues because they run in his family. In the same lecture series, he said, If you're schizophrenic and start hearing voices, it appears that the reason for that is because the areas that are isomorphic with the language centers, he raises his hands to the sides of his head, as though imitating wearing headphones, but are in the right hemisphere, have been released from tonic inhibition by the language centers in the left hemisphere. He points the fingers of his right hand toward the right side of his head and twirls them as one would to indicate insanity. And starting to become active, and the way you interpret that is, he looks quickly to the right, as though spooked. I hear voices. They aren't me. While teaching the same class, he twirled his fingers next to the right side of his head and said that the notion of Satan's rebellion in heaven, which resulted in his being flung out of heaven and cast into hell, was, quote, a story that's always running around in my mind, end quote. He then stopped twirling his fingers and paused, seemingly embarrassed, before murmuring, um, for some peculiar reason, um, Lucifer means light bringer. The story of Satan's rebellion is still running around in Peterson's mind, 
It is the narrative that fuels his journey. Indeed, he has made numerous laudatory remarks about Satan, calling him the spirit of reason and the most wondrous angel brought from the void of God. In his three self-help books about the Holocaust, the words devil, Satan, Lucifer, and Mephistopheles appear 165 times. Peterson, every man for himself, and the devil take the hindmost. Crowley, every man for himself, and the devil take the hindmost. One of Peterson's favorite subjects is satanic possession, and in a praiseful fashion, he has described Hitler as satanically possessed. Hitler was diagnosed by U.S. intelligence as having borderline schizophrenia, which possibly emerged due to being whipped as a child by his father. Peterson has made reference to this psychological assessment without mentioning the diagnosis. Jordan Peterson is a public menace. He claims to be on a mission to help, but is really on a mission to harm. After his split, he spent a lot of time trying to make sense of his nightmares about nuclear explosions, that is, his psychosis. Through the medium of authoritarian, occultic, violent, chastising, divisive, and repetitive language, he is trying to transmit that psychosis to others. This is essentially what Hitler did. Psychologists call this phenomenon shared psychotic disorder. Peterson wants to take revenge on anyone unlucky enough to be drawn into his orbit. The more innocent the victim, the better. He knows that if he goes down, he could take with him anyone who ever supported him. This is what he has said Hitler was trying to achieve, a durable vortex of destruction that affected millions. In other words, Hitler gained victory through defeat. Peterson's trajectory in life almost certainly stems from childhood trauma, perhaps being struck down by mental illness or being physically, psychologically, or sexually abused, possibly by his father, Walter. Peterson has difficulty talking about his father and says their relationship was rough. He has called his father a harsh taskmaster. On Swedish TV, he said, I have a good relationship with my mother, who I love very much, and we shared a sense of humor, which was lovely. And my dad, although he was a harsh taskmaster, Hitler, he may be an exceptionally severe and hard taskmaster. I must be a harsh master. I must demand harshness from myself. My task is more difficult than Bismarck's. He was also very encouraging to me in that he believed I could do whatever I put my mind to, and he helped instill that conviction in me. As for how Walter instilled that conviction in Jordan, the letter to Walter in Maps of Meaning offers a clue. Quote, I learned to follow the rules which you instilled into me through praise and punishment. End quote. I suspect that punishment means abuse. You will have noted that Jordan Peterson said Walter Peterson was a harsh taskmaster and that Hitler called himself a harsh master, along with referring to someone else as a hard taskmaster. It is not happenstance. Hitler's statements come from Mein Kampf, a book that Peterson has plundered. Apart from the reams of plagiarism, we can speculate that Peterson has read Mein Kampf because he has cited extracts from it to his students at the University of Toronto and quotes a passage from it in 12 Rules for Life. What self-help book doesn't include a message from the Fuhrer? In Sweden, Peterson also said that his father, quote, was very honest and a very good craftsman, end quote. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler says that his father had, quote, passed his examination as a craftsman, end quote, and that it is good to be, quote, an honest craftsman, end quote. Whether Peterson was telling Swedes about his father, Walter, or his father, Adolf, I do not know. My analysis is sometimes stymied by Peterson's insanity. Bearing in mind that Peterson said, my father believed I could do whatever I put my mind to, and that his narcissism ensures that stories about unnamed people are usually about himself, here he is telling his students at the University of Toronto how difficult it can be for a child with schizophrenia to grow up under a domineering parent. Hitler bathed four times a day, this is untrue, and he was also an admirer of willpower, so he could stand like this, Peterson gives the Nazi salute, for eight hours in the back of a car. This is also untrue. And the thing about conscientious people is, they're very willpower oriented. And so, if you're unfortunate enough to be sick, chronically, in the house of someone who's conscientious, especially if it's a mental illness, you're more likely to relapse. Because the conscientious person is going to be judgmental. He points an accusatory finger at a student. 
And they're going to say to you, if you're schizophrenic, well, if you just organize yourself and get up in the morning and try a little harder, you could overcome this. Which is, of course, true. Except you can't, because you're schizophrenic. And so the pressure put on you by the anger and the contempt is going to increase the probability that you'll relapse. So orderly people are very judgmental. Orderly people are very judgmental, and the voice with the eyes that appeared in Peterson's mind is also very judgmental. Walter was a harsh taskmaster. The parent in the story assigned tasks with anger and contempt, and Jordan has said that the voice spoke to him harshly. I wonder if Walter realized his son was mentally ill and could not accept it or tried to deal with it by becoming militant. Peterson has said that he had depression even as a small child and cried a lot. Again, I think that depression means schizophrenia and that the split in his early 20s might have been just another stage of the disorder. In any event, if Jordan was furtively telling his students that he was the schizophrenic child and Walter was telling him to get organized, get up in the morning, etc., this would be revealing because Jordan issues similar commands to his childlike followers. Clean your room, make your bed, and so on. And if Jordan was associating Walter with Hitler, this would also fit the picture because in an interview with Joe Rogan, he admitted gifting Walter an imitation Nazi war ensign. When the host asked why he had done that, Peterson fought off a smile and replied, because he's been following what's happening to me online. It was during the same interview that Peterson talked about his followers' moral duty to rescue their dead father from the underworld. He also said, I've been identified, under many circumstances now, with the alt-right. I've been doing every bit of investigation I can into its many manifestations. When another guest criticized Hitler's racial theory, Peterson blew a fuse. I've studied Hitler a lot, and there's a bunch of things that you can't say about him. You can't say he was stupid. You can't say he was without artistic talent. You can't say that he was a poor organizer. You can't say that he wasn't charismatic. You can't say that he didn't do wonders for Germany's economy in the first part of his reign. And so it's very necessary, if you're dealing intelligently with a true monster, that you give the devil his due. Jordan Peterson is a professional con man, a trickster figure. I have even discovered that one of his journal articles includes language and ideas used and espoused by Hitler. That he can channel Hitler in articles, lectures, books, and everyday speech, and that no one notices, is all part of an elaborate hoax. Ditto with his code. Since people do not realize that he employs a code, this gives him power. If his followers happen to understand and approve, great. If they happen to understand and disapprove, he can always deny the charges and explain them away as preposterous. If no one understands, he wins again, because nobody is intelligent enough to figure out what he is really doing, including educated people, like journalists and linguists. In Peterson's world, people are just objects to be manipulated and deceived. Plus, to his way of thinking, he is spreading the word of God, Hitler, so that people might see that the kingdom of God, the Reich, is here on earth and just needs to be restored via a fascist revolution. This can be achieved if his followers aim for paradise, that is, a walled garden. When Hitler wanted the final solution to commence, he told his minions to turn the Reich into a Garden of Eden. And Twelve Rules includes an adaptation of a German painting called Garden of Paradise. However, horror and terror lurk behind the walls provided so wisely by our ancestors. Hitler called the Jews a lurking danger. So we must be like St. George, go on a hero's journey, and slay the dragon. Translation, we Ubermenschen must slaughter them, the Untermenschen, or anyone that, say, a paranoid schizophrenic, might deem to be a reptilian or existential threat. By acting as God's disciple, or his father's son, Peterson can finally please his spiritual father, or his biological father. In addition, he can appease the voices in his mind that tell him what to do. Otherwise, as he has revealed, they get chatty. It was the voices who told him to fight against Bill C-16. They could never abide compelled speech laws because they compel his speech. Those voices would not be silenced by the Jews. I know, it's an extremely strange story. He is gravely mentally ill. It could be just a matter of time before someone deciphers his messages and harms themselves or others, assuming this has not happened already. Some of his followers do seem to comprehend the gist of his messages. Peterson has admitted that he has been contacted by neo-Nazis. 
But then, his gushing about Adolf Hitler and other mass murderers is a bit of a giveaway. From reading comments online, many of Peterson's acolytes appear to be brainwashed and psychologically unwell. Disapproval of JP is forbidden, and people who make critical videos or write unflattering articles can expect hate mail. After Peterson did an interview with Kathy Newman at Channel 4 News, she received so many threatening messages that Channel 4 decided to beef up security. Peterson responded by saying, 10 or 12 of these newspaper articles played this twisty game and accused me of, like, sicking my internet trolls on the poor, hapless journalists. And I thought, this was the dark part of me, right? That's the shadow part that thought, if I wanted to sick my internet trolls on Channel 4, then there'd be nothing but broken windows and riots. And then there's a little part of me who thinks, wouldn't that be fun? Right. And that's where we're at. It's like, because I'm a reasonable person. A very reasonable person. Peterson is a very reasonable person who thinks Lucifer is the spirit of reason. Another concern is that Peterson's fans include children. He has posed for pictures with adoring teenagers, and his documentary, The Rise of Jordan Peterson, includes a scene where a group of 15-year-old boys talk about how Peterson changed their life. As I document in my book, Peterson has an extremely unhealthy obsession with children. He counsels parents to hit their children, makes sexually suggestive remarks about children, and gives instructions on how to psychologically abuse children. I have heard parents say they found Peterson's advice on raising kids to be helpful. To restate, and to be blunt, Jordan Peterson is mad. However, in describing someone who is mad, but not commonly known to be mad, I risk sounding like I am mad. I am not. All my claims are supported by evidence and based on critical analysis. If what I am saying seems unbelievable, I would encourage you to think of the case of the former Air Force Colonel Russell Williams. It seemed impossible that such a respected public figure could be the one committing the break-ins, sexual assaults, and murders in Tweed, Ontario. His neighbor became a suspect, partly because the police ruled out that the perpetrator could have been the colonel, because he was the colonel. As the CBC put it, Williams was above suspicion. Imagine you could travel back in time, tap the officers on the shoulder and say, the man you're looking for is not the neighbor, it's the colonel. And on top of homicide, he's been stealing underwear from girls as young as nine and photographing himself wearing it. He's documented his crimes, hundreds of pictures, bras and panties all stored in boxes. He's not who you think he is. He's out of his tree. They would likely think that you were out of your tree. But we know now that it's true, and Williams was caught because of the evidence. For example, boot prints and tire tracks that put him at the scene of one of the murders. Peterson has left his own tracks and, like Williams, has documented his crimes, presuming they are crimes. I believe he wants to be caught. He often talks about doing or saying something that will suddenly end his career, and a smoking pistol that his enemies have not yet found. How this has not happened already is what is truly unbelievable, which is to say, what I have discovered may be remarkable, but what is more remarkable is that it has not been discovered by anyone else. The evidence is hiding in Peterson's books and YouTube videos. With that in mind, the following section includes a tiny sampling of Peterson's praiseful and defensive statements about Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. Peterson, one of the things I've always thought about Hitler is that, you know people, you have to admire Hitler. That's the thing, because he was an organizational genius. Peterson, no one likes to think they're a Nazi, but everyone is one. Look, it was 95% participation in Germany, and the only thing that distinguishes, you know, the average person from Hitler is that Hitler was an organizational genius. Peterson, granted the opportunity, how many of us would not be Hitlers? Peterson, I do actually believe that Hitler was not a particularly pathological individual. Um, he had a decent First World War record. Peterson, there's one story about Hitler. He, um, he won a medal for heroism. Peterson, Hitler won a medal for bravery. Peterson, Hitler climbed up the ranks of the hierarchy in a remarkable manner. Peterson, it's like the elevation of the person at the top of the dominance hierarchy to the status of some kind of quasi-deity. It certainly happened in Hitler's case. Peterson, I like these pictures of Hitler quite a bit. So there's Hitler as, you know, Knight of the Faith. Peterson, and so that's a representation of Hitler as the jovial father of the race, right? Peterson, 
But that's Hitler as knight, of the blood, roughly speaking. Peterson, Hitler's a knight. He's a white knight, in fact. He's assimilated to the idea of medieval nobility, you know, in its purest form. He's the knight of the people. There's a Wagnerian element to that, and he was a great admirer of Wagner. Wagnerian music, by the way. And Hitler wanted to put music halls in every, classical music halls, in every city in Europe. Peterson, Hitler's the knight. He's the knight of nationalism. Well, that's God the Father too, you know. Peterson, and then there's Hitler as wise father. You see he's surrounded by people there who focused in on him as though he's of archetypal import. Peterson, Hitler's the great father. He's the all-seeing great father in the background. He's like the Wizard of Oz, fundamentally, you know? So he's partly order, and that was a huge part of Hitler, and that's partly what was attractive, because Germany was absolutely in chaos. So that made order more and more attractive, right? Peterson, Hitler appeared to be someone who was very high in orderliness and very high in openness, and I think that was one of the things that made him charismatic. Peterson, so Hitler becomes the embodiment of the dark desire of the mob, and that's partly why he had the charisma. It's right. Peterson, in this Hitler Youth propaganda poster, Hitler and the boy are looking far ahead into the future. That's right. That's good. Peterson, and here's something to think about with regards to Hitler. Because one of the things you might ask is, how the hell could he be so absolutely compelling to his audiences? Peterson, Hitler was able to bring this tremendously artistic force into his politicking, and it was captivating to people. Peterson, Hitler tried to get into art school like four times, so really the person to blame for World War II was the four-person committee that wouldn't let poor Hitler into the, I believe it was, the Viennese School of Art, because he really wanted to go, you know? And he had some artistic talent. Peterson. Hitler spent a lot of his time designing the cities that would be built after World War II, and those cities were generally conceptualized by him as places where the arts, or at least the Nazi version of the arts, could flourish. Peterson. A typical Auschwitz example was the requirement for prisoners to carry 100 pound sacks of wet salt from one side of the compound to another and then back again. Now, that's evil as far as I'm concerned. And you have to think about it from an aesthetic perspective, in a sense, because it's a celebration of horror. Peterson, I can imagine taking someone who just got off a transport train and have them carry a 100-pound sack of wet salt from one side of the compound to the other. People don't like to picture themselves doing that because it's too frightening. But I know perfectly well that I could do that sort of thing, and maybe I could even enjoy it. Peterson, it's like, if you were there, that would have been you. You think, well, I'd be Oscar Schindler. I'd be rescuing the Jews. It's like, no, I'm afraid not. You'd at least not be saying anything. And you might also be actively participating. He fights back a smile. You might also enjoy it. Peterson, Hitler was a master of speech. Peterson, Hitler was unbelievably good at letting the crowd tell him what to say. Peterson, Hitler was unbelievably good at spectacle. Look at how absolutely perfectly ordered that Nuremberg rally is. Peterson, the Nazis were very good at using theatrics. Peterson, and Hitler was very good at listening to the German population, and what they were demanding in a period of chaos was order, and so that was exactly what he decided to provide. Peterson, and Hitler was also an admirer of willpower, so he could stand like this, he gives the Nazi salute, for eight hours in the back of a car. Peterson, Hitler was very proud of his ability to stand like this, he gives the Nazi salute, for eight hours in the back of a car, and his ability to withstand trying circumstances by willpower alone. And this brings us to our next picture. There is no caption. Peterson. So Hitler was very proud of his ability, for example, to stand in the back of a car going through the hordes of people that were worshipping him, and to stand like this for, like, eight hours at a time. He saw that as a single application of will. And he was also obsessed with hygiene, right? Peterson, we should never forget that Hitler was elected. You know, he was elected by a large majority too. It was a landslide vote, the kind no modern democratic leader ever gets. Peterson, and so you can't blame the war on Hitler. That's just not reasonable. Peterson, huge grounds at Nuremberg, where all the Nazis would gather in perfect squares, right? Absolutely perfect. Thousands of people lined up in absolute precision. And then, when they goose-stepped and marched, it was, everyone was exactly the same. So orderliness gone mad. 
You know, and orderliness is actually one of the sine qua non of an industrialized society. And that's one of the things that makes that so terrifying. Because it also means that part of what drove the Germans to their high levels of engineering excellence, for which they were absolutely renowned, not only in World War II, but certainly even now, was that orderliness, that, that unbelievable orderliness. Peterson, Hitler built the biggest parade grounds in human history to host the Nuremberg rallies, and he would get up in front of them on this huge stage with Greek columns, very impressive looking, and have blocks of thousands of people organized perfectly, orderly. The Germans are good at order. Peterson, Hitler was pretty good at speaking. Peterson, Hitler was very good at addressing the crowd. Peterson, Hitler appealed to the darkest fantasies of the crowd, and he was really good at it. Peterson, Hitler started to reindustrialize the economy and was actually pretty damned good at that. Peterson, you want to burn everything that the person who disgusts you owns, and so you'll see people who are pushing the nationalist agenda hard, and Hitler did this beautifully. Everything that was outside of the Aryan domain of purity wasn't to be feared. It was disgusting. It was contemptuous. And it should be destroyed and purified by fire. And that was his message. The Nazis were unbelievably great at using fire of purification as a symbolic message. Peterson. So the Germans had no idea what to do, you know. And Hitler was a canny, canny person with a brilliant, brilliant sense of drama. He was a real... He was a master of dark fire, that guy. And I think his unconscious fantasy was, let's see how much we can destroy before we die in the purifying flames. Peterson does a fist pump. That was Hitler. And so he was a compelling person, and the fantasy that he had in the back of his mind, it was a very hard thing to escape from. That's why the Germans became Nazis. This was like magic that had emerged, and it was black magic. And this brings us to the next picture. There is no caption. Peterson, the morality comes when you're a monster. If you start to understand who you are, then you understand the Nazis. And who wants to understand the Nazis? You know, I can understand sex criminals. I can understand them. Right. I can understand Nazis. And the reason for that is because I can see that as an aspect of myself. Truly. I need your help. Since 2016, the dominant discourse has been Peterson's. He has the biggest megaphone. He controls the narrative. Attempts by the CBC, British GQ, Channel 4 News, the BBC, the Canadian Bar Association, Bernard Schiff, Fox Day, etc. have done almost nothing to slow Peterson down. Media outlets, social media platforms, politicians, law enforcement agencies, and a legion of online critics have been oblivious to the fact that the world's most popular public intellectual is a neo-Nazi. In an era where neo-Nazism is on the rise, the common consensus seems to be, across the political spectrum, that there are no neo-Nazis. They do not exist, and saying that they do is alarmist. What we used to call neo-Nazis or neo-fascists, we now call Trump supporters, the mob that attacked the Capitol, the alt-right, and the populist movement. Would the media and law enforcement have ignored or failed to notice a massive Hitlerite cult based in North America in the 1980s or 90s? I think the answer is no. How can it exist now? Enough. Peterson must be outed and investigated. I cannot do this myself, and I'm asking for your assistance. Thank you for listening, and I direct you again to the rest of the evidence. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them, and I'm willing to assist you in any way I can. And the next picture, this is the paperback edition of The Devil and His Due, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler, Volume 1. This concludes the series. Remember, if you would like to receive a PDF of the transcript, you can email me at teparfit at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and bye for now.